Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new season of Digital Manufacturing Talks. My name is Tyler Fenhaus. I'm the marketing manager for Symphony AI Industrial, and we've got a great talk lined up for you today, focusing on Mom360 Start Edition. As you know, Symphony AI Industrial is a leader in industrial AI solutions in digital manufacturing, plant performance, and optimization, and connected worker. Symphony AI Industrial is a Symphony AI vertical. There are several Symphony AI verticals. You can see them there on your screen. And we are one of the largest, if not the largest, enterprise AI companies with more than 1,600 customers and 3,000 employees. We've got a good amount of people in the crowd today, and we appreciate you all showing up. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A question and answer at the end. You can ask our presenter, Chris Rickey, uh, live right here, and he will answer you right in the chat. So make sure you are writing your questions down as we go along. Uh, also, if you have any problems, um, technical difficulties, I'll be in the background to help you out with that. And also be on the lookout for any poll questions. There are a couple to keep you engaged and kind of guide Chris's performance here today, his presentation. All right, you didn't come here to hear me ramble, so I'm going to hand it off to Chris, and he is going to get things started. So, Chris, take it away. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you may be at the world. Um, welcome to our Mom360 Start Edition uh, Go uh, webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the the release of Mom360 that we have coming out in just a few days. Uh, what we're referring to as our Start Edition. Uh, before we get into that too far, though, I want to just let you know a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Chris Rickey. I'm the product manager here at Symphony AI Industrial for our MOM360 product line. Uh, I've been more than 25 years in the MOM and MES space, uh, and I've worked in a lot of different industries, uh, you know, med device and automotive, electrical assembly, um, electronic assembly, CPG, pharma, et cetera. Uh, and I live up here in New Hampshire where it's a beautiful uh, 80 degrees today, sun is shining. So um, I hope everybody's having a great summer so far. But let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, turn that off. Uh, OK, so before we get too deep into it, right, I just want to set the context for what we're talking about, right? So so I'm assuming you guys joining, you already have some familiarity with what MOM is and, and what MES is in general. But you know, when, when we talk about mom, um, everybody has a mom, right? Um, and that's true in a factory too. Every factory has some type of an MES or a mom solution uh, running there. It may be on paper, it may be in Excel, uh, they may be trying to do it in, inside of your ERP, uh, but the capabilities that a mom satisfies are being done somehow. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at uh, how to do that in a digital approach uh, so that we um, you know, get more insight um, and can uh, you know get more efficiencies and and be able to put analytics on top of this stuff. So MES, uh, you know, MES is part of a bigger solution set called MOM. Um, MES is the manufacturing execution system part of that. That's really kind of your production. You know, what you think about of you know how do you know what product to produce and when to produce it. MOM covers a lot of other stuff too, like a lot of other site level or or factory level systems like your. Uh, your PLM, your LIM systems, your uh, um, quality systems, uh, maintenance systems, those all fall under the, the larger category of MOM. Mostly what we're going to talk about today is the MES capabilities. Some of the questions that we answer with, with MES in general, you know, if you're an operator on the floor, some of the things that we're going to um, answer for you is, you know, what should you be working on right now? What should you be doing next? You know, is the equipment clean? Basically providing that operator with uh, the type of information that he needs in order to perform his job uh, and keep things moving uh, smoothly. From a, a supervisor's perspective, you know, they have different needs, right? But it's uh, been driven by the same uh, same process and workflow that that operator is going through. So understanding who touched a product, you know, is the product expired? Where has this raw ingredient been used? If you think about traceability issues, things like that. So my first poll question, um, how digitized is your MES right now? Uh, you know, if you, if you guys are coming from a, a factory, um, you know, if you're a part of a manufacturing organization as i mentioned before you have some kind of of mes solution out there um so how are, how are you guys doing it right now are you still doing this on paper 
Um, do you have uh, somewhat of a solution, but you're still maybe manually entering data? You don't have anything coming from your automation, so it's it's really just more of paper on glass. Um, or maybe you're getting your data from the IoT systems and and other systems, um, but you're having to move data, you know, from one system to another manually. You know, maybe you you have a a production planner or something that at the end of the week they go in and you know fill all the information in ERP or something. Or maybe you guys are fully integrated top to bottom. You know, this is all uh, this is all old hat to you guys, and uh, and you're looking for what comes next. All right. Can you, uh, Chris? Can you can you see the responses there? I can. I can. It's kind of coming in live for me. I I submitted. Um, People are still submitting. We got about 20 responses. Uh, looks like 18% uh, still on paper, 41% uh, have a solution, but still manually editing data, and 41% data is captured from IoT, but still moving between systems, and 0% fully integrated. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it looks like uh, we're about uh, uh, 20, 40, 40, right? So, uh, so about 80% of the people have some level of automation integration, 20% um, or so still on paper, which, um, you know, I'm not sure how many, uh, you know, how many replies we had here, but it's, 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 all, it's better than I expected, right? I, I've, I still continue to go into factories and see customers where, you know, they're, they're big multi-international organizations um, and they have factories that are still, you know, are moving paper down the production line. So, uh, so maybe things are getting better. Um, all right, let's move on. So uh, let's look at what MOM360 is, right? So as I said, this is part of our start edition. Um, and really what the goal here is, um, is to be able to get up and running extremely quickly, right? So, uh, so we're talking about having MOM360B <clears throat> put in place uh, within a matter of, of hours to days, and then being able to get... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, be able to get insights and uh, and return on value or return on investment out of that within uh, within days or weeks. Um, you know, most a lot of MES uh, projects often take uh, you know definitely weeks, probably months, um, sometimes years uh, before MES can be comp uh, completely deployed. Um, the way we're, we're packaging this up is we're looking at this in terms of uh, really kind of these three main process flows. So we got inline um, inline process flow, our inline material flow, and our inline quality flow. Uh, and so these are the three approaches that we're taking. Uh, the idea is, you know, as a, uh, you know, a customer coming on, you want to get up and running quickly with one of these, uh, you know, we're going to put that in place and uh, and get you guys running really quickly. Um, what we mean by each one of these, so process flow is you can think of it like order, order management, order tracking, right? So being able to understand what orders exist uh, what the the state of those orders are, uh, where they reside, where they've been dispatched to, are they started, are they completed, right? This is kind of bread and butter MES, uh, being able to understand, you know, overall what the process looks like. Um, the material flow is, you know, it builds upon that process flow. So this is now looking at what material um, are we consuming, what materials are we producing along the way. Uh, are we producing scrap? Are we producing waste? Or is this all good stuff? Uh, we can also do things like goods receipt to, to bring that material into the uh, into the system. Um, and of course, we're 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 managing all this stuff in the context of of those orders and 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 batches, so we can send that information back to uh, to the ERP system. Um, our inline quality flow. Uh, this is really about you know tracking those uh, critical critical to quality uh, parameters uh, throughout the process. Um, we're you know, looking at what that, uh, that data that we're collecting along the way, comparing that to specifications or expected values uh, and understanding when things are uh, not meeting expectations. Uh, so we could take those and you know, do something with that from a workflow perspective. We've, we're setting on top of uh, quite a few enablement features. Um, so these aren't necessarily, you know, the, the, this is more the kind of the, the, the back end non-functional stuff that, uh, that, that makes a lot of this stuff, uh, uh, that enables a lot of these operations. Um, so the first piece of this is our, our hybrid architecture, right? So, you know, when we release MOM, um, uh, you know, we've, we've been, uh, MOM came into the marketplace uh, just a little over a year ago now. 
Um, and this is one of the, the differentiators for us is, is looking at this hybrid architecture. Uh, a lot of MES vendors, you know, are, are moving towards a cloud, uh, a cloud offering. Um, and some, some customers are ready for that, right? Some customers are okay uh, running their, their MES in the cloud. Uh, you know, if you have a very low automation and low, um, uh, you know, complexity, you can, you can do that stuff in the cloud. And if the network goes down, you know, you'll just, you just fill the data in later or something. Um, but a lot of customers aren't quite ready for that yet. Uh, and so we kind of take a hybrid approach here where we can have uh, our system of intelligence running up in the cloud and uh, providing things like you know high-end analytics, uh, data archive, um, uh, and then and, and be that system of record so that uh, that we can look at across plants and across sites uh, to see what uh, what kind of insights we can gain from that. But at the same time, we want to keep uh, uh, an on-prem uh, close to the manufacturing uh, component as well. Um, and and this allows us to have you know the IoT connectivity allows us to, to to cache data up and store information so that if we do lose connectivity back up to that system intelligence for some period of time we can keep production running maybe we can't run an analytical report uh, but at least we can we can keep the uh, the production moving down the line so it's kind of the best of the both worlds. Um, we, uh, as part of that, we have uh, setting on that that edge piece is part of our IoT connectivity, uh, and so we have a universal connector that allows us to connect to a, a huge array of different types of um, automation equipment, uh, sensors, devices, uh, as well as enterprise systems. Um, uh, so we have a huge library of, of those connectors. Uh, and what this does is this abstracts out all of that data, regardless of where it resides or where it lives. Um, away from, you know, how do we technically get to that data? You know, are we using OPC to connect to it? Is it Modbus? Is it a SQL uh, results? Um, and allows us to focus on using the data the way that we need to, whether it's in reporting or dashboarding or, or, or recipe execution. Um, not necessarily part of our uh, uh, our start edition release, uh, but we also have our enterprise uh, 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 application management. Um, what this does is this allows, you know, once uh, once you get uh, MOM360 deployed at uh, one or more of your sites, uh, and especially as you start adding additional sites, uh, the, the number of nodes and the number of servers that you have running MOM uh, can start growing uh, quite quickly. Uh, you know, we have customers where we're running at, uh, you know, over 500 plants um, you know, for a single customer. Uh, and so trying to manage that and understand what versions of software is running, um, you know, how, how, what kind of problems we may be having, are there, you know, log files filling up, things like that, uh, can get very difficult to manage. Um, and so what enterprise uh, uh, application management does for us is um, uh, it, it connects to all those different nodes out in the, 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 the greater, enterprise infrastructure and uh, and consolidate so the management all those so this allows us to quickly deploy bug fixes uh, new releases uh, new capabilities uh, from a centralized location as part of this overall architecture uh, you know we set on top of a very composable uh, platform the um, the idea here is instead of having kind of these vertical uh, uh, application-based uh, processes, we're able to extend this stuff local, uh, or I should say horizontally, um, so that we can have you know pre-built UIs and pre-built uh, widgets and components that we can use uh, depending upon what our particular use case is. Uh, we had a set of services that can be reused either by those UIs or others, and this allows us to do things like pull out a certain chunk of ca uh, capability that uh, uh, that we may need at one location and replace that with another. Um, and as long as they, you know, they satisfy the same requirements in terms of, you know, what they're doing and what kind of fa uh, functionality they have, it's uh, somewhat um, uh, abstracted and 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 uh, doesn't require any work really on the on the part of the business to to make use of those new components. Um, we set on top of a you know, a workflow driven, you know, low code, no code uh, uh, development environment as well. Uh, that really allows us to extend that out uh, to, to new use cases um, and allows us to, to execute those within the context of the overall MOM execution as well. Um, 
another capability that we have setting on top of mom is our deskless worker. Um, so there are use cases where you may have uh, like a mobile uh, a mobile use case that uh, requires um, you know part of the execution of the process to be done uh, on a mobile device. And so our deskless worker uh, capabilities really provide for that. So we can start a process that's running you know maybe on a typical static work center or workstation uh, next to your uh, your work cell and uh, and then execute part of that workflow uh, on the mobile device where you maybe need to to, to walk around the uh, maybe the, the the device that you're building and and you know collect some quality data or perform some uh, some work instructions or something and then on top of all of this we have manufacturing intelligence that's going to allow us to uh, be able to uh, take all this information that we're collecting along the way um, and understand things. Uh, so like uh, OEE, for example, to understand, uh, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if we have low e OEE, but uh, we have a certain set of orders that are coming in, uh, maybe we could use some of that information to predict what our OEE will be if we run orders in a certain, uh, a certain schedule, for example. Um, so really the goal here is to start leveraging that data that's being collected, uh, all that high fidelity uh, uh, operational data, all the consumption data, the job data, and the quality data uh, to be able to get those additional insights from it. Um, generative AI, the, you know, the latest buzzword everybody's excited about, uh, chat GPT. Um, and uh, we're also looking into it as well. So this is still a little bit um, uh, aspirational, uh, but we are in the process of looking at how we can apply generative AI on top of this. Uh, so some of the things that we're imagining are, um, you can imagine like a, a co-pilot where we can come out and ask questions of the mom, uh, you know, maybe what order we should run next, or do we have any inventory issues that are coming up that are going to cause quality problems, for example. Um, okay, so our next poll question here, um, you know, speaking of AI and, uh, you know, generative AI, you know, are you guys already addressing some of these uh, uh, AI use cases with the mom data that you currently have? Uh, this is probably only for those that uh, that 80 percent that already have some level of automation involved. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, are you guys are, are you guys leveraging AI yet? So um, not yet, but you're you're interested or maybe you're looking at some ideas. Um, maybe you've already started and you're doing some of the typical kind of low hanging fruit with with AI around uh, maybe predictive maintenance or uh, prescriptive maintenance on some of those production assets. Um, maybe you're looking at something like predictive quality or a predictive OEE, uh, maybe optimized scheduling. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, in the comments about, you know, some of the other types of use cases that you guys are looking at uh, that maybe we haven't uh, haven't mentioned here as well. All right, looks like we got almost half the room. Uh, get your responses in and uh, we'll share those results. OK, so it's looking like currently 13%. Uh, um, they're, they're on paper, 46%. Uh, the majority of the room, uh, no AI yet, but they are curious. 25% typical predictive maintenance on process asset, uh, maybe some pres prescriptive and 17% uh, predictive quality. Awesome, okay, cool. Yeah, that's, um, that's, again, that's very interesting, right? So it doesn't, it's not extremely surprising on the low end, on the high end, the 17% that are looking at some of those, you know, those additional use cases, that's that's pretty exciting, right? Um, you know, you guys are, are, are leveraging into the data that you've got uh, and being able to get some, some additional uh, value from that. So that's pretty awesome. Um, okay, cool. All right, well, so uh, with that, I'm gonna guys show you guys around some of this stuff. So if you guys will bear with me while I switch over. All right, so um, we're gonna look at what uh, MOM360 uh, Start Edition looks like. Um, and so we're gonna hit just on a couple of these, uh, uh, these things that we talked about today. Um, and, uh, and and see how some of the stuff works. I'll be playing the role of you know a variety of different users, um, and so I'll try to point that out. Uh, but it's you know it, but I am playing multiple roles here. I, you know this isn't all uh, just kind of one front end for you know every user that uh, uh, that logs on. It's uh, you know, different people will see different things. 
Um, so what we'll do here is we'll get started. And um, the first thing that we'll do is look at uh, our production orders, right? So we're playing the role here maybe of like a production planner um, where, you know, these orders may came out of the ERP system. We do have the ability to manage them internally. Uh, so we could come out here and create new orders if we needed to. And here we see a handful of orders that I've created um, for uh, the last couple days in various states. Um, so we're, we're producing some ethanol here. So it's a, a, an ethanol solvent based solution that uh, that we are we are producing. Um, and I've got a couple of orders. I can start here with this one that's currently in a in process state, just to look around at that a little bit, so we can see some of the information about it. You know, when this order actually started, when it was planned to start, what recipe we're using. And we got this uh, batch sequence down here. Uh, the batch sequence, you can kind of think about this as uh, a way that we might, you know, add some additional fidelity to the OLR order. Meaning, you know, if the order was for maybe 100,000 liters of material, uh, we might not want to do all 100,000 at a time. Um, and so maybe we do 10,000 liters at a time and, and break that up into multiple batch sequences. But in this case, we got the whole uh, quantity of uh, 1,250 running. And we see that it's currently in an in-process state. Um, we can see, uh, you know, the jobs that were created. So what we do is we um, create a series of jobs based upon the particular um uh recipe that we're using to to build this particular uh, batch sequence and so here we can see a handful of jobs that were created uh in various states and again we've got all of these are in a uh, currently in a, a, a started state but we don't have uh so far we've only completed that one premix um, if we look at another order for example maybe uh uh, this one here, which is the one that I uh, actually know this one, uh, the one I just created this morning. So far, we don't have any um, batch sequences created, uh, but we do, uh, you know, but we are in a release state. So I can go ahead and create a batch sequence for that. Um, and again, this stuff may be automated, you know, so if if your ERP is already providing this information, you know, that would come through as part of the, the integration. Uh, but for for what we're doing here, it's all kind of manual, right? And so I can see, uh, you know, this batch sequence, and then I could release that off and send that off to the factory floor uh, to be actually uh, produced. Um, and so um, if we look at that recipe, though, right? So we're looking at this ethanol-based solvent. Uh, it might be interesting to understand what that recipe really means, right? And so what we can do is flip over to our uh, our recipe here. Um, and so we have here is our uh, our large batch ethanol solvent recipe. Uh, and for us right now, our recipe uh, is basically made up of, um, so it's got the product that we're producing. So again, it's the ethanol, that's the target quantity. Um, and we have a plan quantity here that you know, if we, we execute this recipe as, as defined, it would produce a thousand liters. Um, and then we can see that series of operations that we need to go through. Um, so we have a material prep, uh, a premix, a react, a finish, and a package. Um, and you can see along the way we have things like, uh, for example, what asset class that we need to use for that premix operation. So this allows us to define the set of capabilities that we need uh, in order to perform premix. Um, uh, when we go to dispatch, for example, we'll only be able to dispatch these jobs to uh, uh, to mixers that satisfy that that particular asset class. Um, we also have defined here what does the bill of material look like. So uh, whenever we get to to premix and we need to start consuming materials, what are we going to be consuming? So we have uh, you know some some materials that need to be consumed in various quantities uh, at that operation. Um, so that really makes up our recipe. Um, and you know as we you know as we move forward, there will be additional capabilities built in this recipe, um, uh, things like around you know quality and um, uh, and other stuff that uh, that we're currently working on. So, all right. So let's take a look at. Uh, so that's what it looks like, kind of on the uh, the system of intelligence side, right? When we think about that hybrid architecture that I mentioned earlier, you know, this stuff is is managed kind of centrally, um, and uh, and that allows us to do those, you know, ERP integrations one place, um, and then uh, connect or collect all this stuff locally. Um, but if we move over to the edge side, um, so this is uh, so we've switched hats here, and now we're looking at this from a, an operator on the shop floor. Uh, so these jobs have already come down; they've already been dispatched, um, and we can see that sitting here at this premix uh, work center, we can see the jobs uh, that have been um, uh, been dispatched. 
Um, if we look, uh, we can see that one that we just completed after a refresh. So there's that uh, uh, that order that we just uh, put into a release date. Um, and so now we can, uh, as an operator, decide what we want to start. So we can see that one of these jobs has already started and maybe we take this next one. Uh, what this is, um, so this is our typical kind of, uh, you know, the, 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 the bread and butter of our operator screen. This is where our operators are going to uh, start uh, jobs and, and spend a lot of their time working. Um, and so uh, we see a few things here. So this is our uh, our, our, our work center console. Um, we try to you know give our operator the information they need so we can see what job they're working on and the material we're working on. Uh, we can get this job started. Uh, and once it gets started, we can uh, start seeing the information that we're collecting along the way. Now again, right now we're doing a lot of this stuff manually. Um, and uh, but you know, if we have uh, automation in place that can provide some of this data, we can absolutely use that IoT gateway that uh, that we talked about during the enablement features to start pulling this information from uh, from the control system or from other systems uh, and having those events driven uh, automatically as opposed to manually through a uh, user screen. We can start seeing some of the composability pieces as well. So in this case, uh, for this mixing operation, uh, we can see the types of actions that we can perform here. So we can record some consumption, we can record waste, we can record downtime. Um, for pre-mixing, you know, what we're gonna do is, is focus on some of this consumption. So now we can start seeing how that, that recipe starts working with the jobs that we're dealing with. So when we created this job for the, uh, the pre-mix operation, um, we brought that bill of material over as well. So in order to do this, we need 800 liters of uh, this ethyl alcohol. Um, we can consume uh, a specific batch. So if, um, uh, if we're tracking this at the batch level, uh, we can record what that batch number is. So if I had a barcode scanner and some batches, you know, I can scan that material. Um, we may be getting this information from, uh, you know, allocated materials that's already allocated for this particular order or job, or maybe the materials that we have setting on hand. So there's a variety of ways that we could uh, get this information. Um, so we can uh, record that that quantity uh, as well. So you know whether we type this in manually, uh, we could use our our you know big touch screens if we're in a you know a heavily gowned environment um, and we need to you know maybe use a touch screen to do that uh, or again you know this information could be coming from the automation um, so we could go through that bill of material basically and record all of those quantities that we need and once we get that done uh, we can do that confirmation um, and then we can see uh, that information that is collected along the way, uh, who did it, when it happened. Uh, there's just tons of fidelity behind all this data uh, that allows us for, uh, when it comes to reporting and analytics, to, uh, to dig a lot deeper. But from an operator's perspective, they're probably done here, so we're gonna let them go ahead and complete this job. Uh, once they complete that, uh, that job completes on and it moves on to uh, the next step, and then our operator can come back out and maybe start the next job. OK, um, so that's one type of operation that we have, right? In that case, you know, the thing that we focused on mostly was really around our operator uh, consuming some of that material. Um, if we take a look at uh, the next operation, which would be our reaction step, um, here we have uh, our list of, uh, we've logged onto our reactor work center now, right? And we can see that it's already in a running state um, and that we already have this job that's out there running. Um, if we take a look at that thing, um, you know, we can see uh, that um, there's no consumption data and there's no, uh, uh, you know, we've not really collected any uh, any data out here, but we have a different set of actions that we can perform here. You know, from a, uh, from a, a workflow perspective, you know, what happens at this step after we, we mix that stuff up at the previous step and move that on over here to our reactor. Um, this is where, you know, we're going to let that process run for some period of time and let that material run. Um, so we're probably monitoring things. So if we look, uh, if we come over, you know, we can see our operator uh, has access to, in this case, the temperature of that reaction chamber that uh, that we're, we're running that through. And we can see this spike in temperature, which may be a good indication to the operator that, you know, there was a problem that he may need to go out and investigate. Um, we can trigger based on this kind of thing. So like whenever we see the spike, um, uh, we can be monitoring this information and uh, trigger like a, a, a branch in the workflow, uh, notifications or, or something else, you know, depending upon what makes sense there. 
uh, from our um, uh, from our operator's perspective, though, what he needs to do is maybe collect some data, right? And so if he comes out here um, and does an inspection, um, what that does is that triggers an inspection that needs to be performed. Um, that inspection in this case is going out to a uh, uh, out to that mobile client, uh, and we'll actually take a look at that in a little bit. So uh, we'll we'll skip that for now. Um, so uh, so from a reaction guy, we'll let him uh, continue on with with what he's doing, and we'll move on to our next operation. The next thing that we'll take a quick look at here is our finishing tank. Um, so again, just like before, we have that list of of, of jobs that uh, that are either currently in process or need to be ran. Um, and again, we already have one out here that's running. Um, just like before, uh, we have our inspection uh, that we need to perform here. Um, and so in this case, whenever we do our inspection, it's actually going to create uh, the uh, the connected, um, or I'm sorry, the uh, the deskless worker um, piece. And it just occurred to me that I was not quite ready to show that uh, from a demo perspective. Um, I'm going to skip that for now. Uh, but if we have time, maybe I'll come back to that and see what that uh, that execution looks like. Um, and then so, um, uh, and then we'll take a look at our last piece here, which is really our, our bottler, um, where we have, again, a different set of actions that are running. In this case, we've already consumed, or I'm sorry, produced some materials along the way. So we've produced a couple quantities of, uh, of material. You know, recording consumption is not so different than before of uh um you know are we consuming into a uh, the batch that's being produced which is usually probably the default or do we want to specify a specific batch and how much do we want to do so maybe we'll produce another 35 along the way um and along the way all this information of course is being recorded and can go back up to the actually i, I take that back that was the consumption of bottles wasn't it yeah that was the bottles that we were consuming um uh, our productions over here right so what production do we need to go and so maybe we filled those 35 one liter bottles uh, that we consumed and produced those, right? So we can see those productions along the way. Um, now, all of this information, of course, is going into our um, uh, our analytics piece as well. Um, you know, we're monitoring things like our, our downtime. So if this machine goes down for some reason, you know, we have, you know, what reasons that we might go down for. In this case, our bottler only has one a broken bottle. So we can move that uh, that uh, bottler into a, uh, a not running state or a stop state. This information is going back up to our our analytics engine and um, uh, you know for doing things like OE analysis. So uh, the time you know that we're spent here uh, in a stop state is going to uh, go against those numbers. Um, and if we put it back into a running state, uh, we can see that information. So we can see those uh, downtime events that we have and how long that we were down for and why. Uh, not so interesting. We only have the one reason right now in this particular bottler. Um, but as I said, that's that's all going back out to our um, uh, our analytics tool for uh, for analytics. So if we, um, you know, from an execution perspective, maybe uh, maybe that's the end of what our, our our operators need to do. They've gone through consumption, uh, they've gone through production, uh, they've done a little bit of, uh, of uh, downtime tracking. Um, we kind of skipped over some of the quality pieces, but uh, you know, theoretically along the way, they would have collected some of that quality data. I mean, what you can do now, um, you know, maybe from our, our quality people or maybe our, our plant supervisors or something want to come out and uh, look at some of that data. So if I come over to our um, analysis, we can look at, um, maybe we look at this capper that's out here running. I got some good data out there. Um, and if I look at the last month, I think, uh, for my capper, uh, three months. There we go. Um, so we have, you know, this capper that's out there running that's been collecting, uh, you know, data along the way. Um, we can see, you know, we ran from April till May, um, and we had a certain amount of production that we were expected to produce. We can see how much we actually did produce and how much of that was good. And we can see the downtime events. So a very typical kind of uh, uh, OEE um, set of KPIs you, you might expect. Um, we can also look at those trends over, uh, you know, over the course of the the time that we have. So, it uh, looks like we only have data for that one month, and then we have no data for the other two months. So, um, so a typical type of of information that we collect along the way. Uh, so, really, that's probably 
this point we're we're pushing up against uh, the end of our time. So um, let's click back over and maybe look at what we saw, right? So with uh, Mom Start Edition, which again, we're gonna be releasing in the next few days, the goal is be able to get up and running extremely quickly, um, get the stuff in place um, and be able to start generate some of these reports and having this data available uh, for additional analysis uh, very quickly. Um, provides kind of those uh, that that low level uh, framework that you need um, and gives you that place where you can extend from that uh, and start building out additional information that you may want to collect around uh, the jobs that you're running or the material that you're tracking uh, or the quality that you're collecting along the way uh, to get additional insights. Um, so with that, if you guys do have any, uh, if you want to see more, I would recommend you contact our uh, our general manager, uh, Mark Besser. Um, he'd be happy to get an email from you uh, and dig deeper into that. So with that, I would say, you know, do we have any questions? Let's go over here to the chat. Um, let's see the poll. Poll yeah, uh, does the. Yep, so see one from from Sebastian. Does the hybrid architecture give flexibility, meaning if the customer wants to go and have their solution full cloud, would that be possible? Absolutely. Yeah. So um so the um you know we're we're at this point, uh mom is not like a SaaS offering. So it's not uh uh it's not something that we're gonna offer as a SaaS. I should say right now it's not something we're offering as a SaaS. So we would still be doing a um a deployment, you know, for you as a customer, uh, and you could you have the choice of doing that. You know, we could we we could host it, so we could offer it as a SaaS in that regard. Um, you could host it in your own cloud. Um, you know, if you already have, uh, you know, partnership with Azure or AWS or somebody else, um, or if you want to deploy it, you know, in your own data center, you know, at a corporate data center, or even if you want to deploy it on prem, so um, that centralized piece can be deployed anywhere that you want the uh the edge component uh theoretically we could deploy it anywhere as well um it just depends on you know your level of um, risk aversion with uh, you know if you do put that edge component in the cloud um, and you have a high level of automation you know through that iot gateway piece um you know are you going to be able to tolerate any network outages um because it the you know the iot connection back to the edge component does need uh kind of an always-on connection um, and so we wouldn't want uh, you know to to break that. So typically we'd put that uh, that edge piece on prem, uh, maybe on a very small uh, you know server stack or, or set of hardware, you know two CPUs, uh, maybe uh, you know 16, 24 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's you know pretty small footprint, um, or can be a pretty small footprint depending upon how much uh, you know processing and transactions you have going through there. But yeah, we that that's part of our hybrid architecture and part of our composability to be able to put these things where, you know, where it makes sense for you uh, and, and depending upon what you need. Let's see, um, another question, quality sampling triggered by event schedule manual. Yeah, so um, uh, so the, you know, the, the way we, we kind of saw it, again, I kind of glossed over it, but uh, we were uh, manually triggering that, right? But you can imagine that event may be coming from, uh, you know, to your point, some kind of a, a schedule. So maybe doing it like every five minutes or based upon some type of production event, like when the, uh, you know, when we start the job or when the, um, uh, you know, right before we complete the job, um, it could be based upon uh, a schedule. So, you know, we do this every, you know, every day at noon. Um, or it may come from uh, maybe the IoT systems triggering it. So the uh, the control system somehow understands when we need to, to sample some data and collect some data. So we could pop that up uh, based on that. Um, how is plant specific customizations managed? Um, so plant specific customization. So um, on the uh, on the on the plant specific side, uh, so we'll talk about the the edge component of mom, right? That's really where the plant specific customizations come into play. Uh, and we're allowed to create those workflows uh, that execute at these particular um, operations. Uh, you know, they're defined within that plant specific edge component. Now they may be managed, you know, if, if we talked about that enterprise management, we may be managing these uh, centrally, uh, and then pushing them down to uh, down to the specific plants. But it just depends, you know, do you manage plant specific customizations at the plant, or you do that at the enterprise? But you know, that's something you know we we can manage it both ways. 
Um, and so then we tie those, uh, you know, those, those workflows are targeted toward those specific plants uh, and therefore that specific edge components. Um, and so that whenever we get to that plant and we want to execute the recipe for, you know, the mixing operation, we're going to use that plant specific mixing operation uh, uh, or, or, you know, workflow in order to do that. So I'm, I'm, I hope that answers the question that you're, uh, that you're thinking about there. Um, next question there is, is it possible to have custom interfaces made for like a CNC machine? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we do have a lot of, uh, kind of pre-built connectors, a very large library of connectors that we have, uh, you know, built up over the years. Um, but it's also a very, very well understood use case of how do we create new connectors? Um, you know, the, the, that's part of, um, so as part of a service offering or as part of the, uh, the, the, the deployment process, we could, um, you know, understand what that connector needs to look like and what the capabilities need to be and how you would expect to use it. Uh, but yeah, that is, you know, that's one of the, the values that, uh, uh, that we talk about with the IoT gateway is to be able to expand upon that connector library uh, with either custom ones, you know, for that's very specific for a customer, but we'll also continue to, to build that out with, uh, you know, more generic and reusable uh, connectors as well. Okay. All right. Uh, awesome. A lot of great interaction there at the end. Uh, Chris, that was a fantastic presentation. Great demo. Uh, a lot of, lot of people here. Really appreciate you showing up. Um, if anybody wants a recording um, of this, I will have it uh, shortly. Um, I'll have a YouTube link. So if you want that, just throw that in the chat. We will definitely get that recording to you. Or if you want a copy of the presentation via PDF or something like that, reach out to Chris, Ricky, uh, throw it in the chat or Mark Besser, and we will definitely get that to you. As we close up here, I just want to thank everybody again for showing up. And I just want to announce this is a new season of digital manufacturing talks, and we are going all the way through the end of the summer, the end of fall, all the way to December, covering plant performance, connected worker solutions, and digital manufacturing. So you're going to want to tune in. Chris Ricky is back on August 9th. Uh, so we've got uh, something for everybody. So you're going to want to tune in to see what we got coming down the pipeline. All you need to do is go to symphonyindustrial.ai, go to resources and drop down to webinars, and you can register right there for these events. So again, thank you everyone for showing up. Chris, fantastic job. Everybody, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.